Hello everybody, I'm Future Eternal Flame here, and today I want to talk to you guys about what this project is, which this is basically the full version of my entire What If project of What If Yuji Got Shrine Early Against Mahito, with some extra scenes added in, some things re-recorded because I didn't like how they sounded originally, basically all that good jazz as I get into my next What If projects, which are both going to be What If Nobara Ended Up Surviving, and What If Yuki Trained Yuji. Now I'm going to be honest with you guys, I have no idea if What If Nobara Survived is already up to the channel right now or not, because I was actually working on this before I started recording this, so there's a chance it is, there's a chance it isn't, that's for the future to know. But I just want to take this moment to thank you all for showing so much support to the series, this really wouldn't be here without you guys. So, let's get into the full movie of What If Yuji Awoke Shrine Early. As Toto and Mahito began their battle, Toto had repeatedly dodged every single one of Mahito's attacks, until Mahito had gone for a Black Flash, attempting to land a Black Flash on Toto. However, right in that moment, Toto swapped places instead with his brother, his brother Yuji Itadori. As the thoughts gone through Yuji's head, you've got it from here, the words from Nanami. As Yuji thinks to himself, I was about to use my sins as an excuse to run away. I'm sorry, Nanamine. I was about to take the easy way out. Before, Yuji landed a Black Flash right on Mahito's gut. However, in this timeline, there was a slight difference, a slight change in comparison to what would happen normally. As in this timeline, Yuji landed a Black Flash on Mahito's gut. However, after he landed that Black Flash, four scissor lines appeared on Mahito's gut before starting to cut at his body as he was launched away, as Yuji had now awoken Shrine, the curse technique of Ryom and Sukuna. As all three of them were brought to a pause, all three of them having different thoughts circulating through their heads. As Mahito began to think to himself, is Sukuna helping him? No, that can't be it. Sukuna would never help Yuji. Sukuna hates Yuji just as much as I do. After all, that's the reason he didn't kill me before back when we fought for the first time, because we laughed at him together. And that cut, while strong, it felt weaker than the one Sukuna had delivered to me even when he was in that state. While well, at the same time for Toto, Toto was thinking that Yuji never had a curse technique, so there was no way he could land slashes like that. It didn't make sense. However, Toto and then later on Mahito both realized what had happened. Yuji Itadori had awakened the curse technique of Ryom and Sukuna. However, the thoughts going through Yuji's head in that moment were a little bit different, as Yuji had his hands shaking for a moment because he had used the same technique that he had witnessed end so many lives in Shibuya, the same technique of Ryom and Sukuna himself. As thoughts began to go through his head, thoughts of questioning if he was Sukuna or if he wasn't Sukuna, if he was no different than him, and the world was just spinning at him and laughing at him. Even though Yuji had just awoken Shrine, he chose not to use it. He chose to reject it. He didn't want to be a Sukuna. He didn't want to be the next Sukuna because he didn't want to use the same technique that had caused so much pain to so many people. As it was then, Maito was the first to break the silence, as he then said, Well, 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 Sukuna Jr.'s finally up and awake, huh? Using your old dad's technique, you're gonna cut me apart like how he cut apart so many people? Come on, come on, bring it on. However, in that moment, Toto clapped and appeared right behind Mahito and landed his own Black Flash on Mahito as well, as Toto then appeared right beside Yuji and said, Don't focus on that for now. For now, we have an opponent to fight, and that should be our main focus above all else, brother. As now all three opponents were operating at 120% of their potential. As the three began their battle, this battle looking very similar to the one in canon, however, this Mahito was doing something very different, in particular to the original Mahito, as he was actually focusing on making larger transfigured humans, larger transfigured humans to get Yuji more and more into the mentality of using Shrine, almost as if he was trying to break Yuji by making him forced to use Shrine by giving him circumstances where using Shrine would be optimal as he wanted to make sure that guilt was overwhelming Yuji more and more to get him into a similar mindset to what he was when they first started this fight. Once Yuji would be mentally broken, Mahito would go in for the strike, or at least that was his plan. Unfortunately for Mahito though, with Toto around, there was no chance he could ever mentally break Yuji. Furthermore, Mahito was at an even weaker percentage of his soul HP than he was in canon, as this Mahito is around 35% of his HP due to taking additional damage from the cleaves. However, this Mahito as a result is just more pressured to activate their 0.2 second domain expansion, and as a result of that, Toto loses his hand. But furthermore, the conversation between Mahito and Sukuna is a little bit different, where instead of Mahito telling Sukuna to not interfere and there wouldn't be enough time for him to interfere and that he'd kill Yuji before Sukuna could even awaken, instead, in this timeline, he ends up saying to him, Even though Yuji is now awoken near Curse Technique, he still doesn't have a chance to beat me, so just enjoy the show. 
However, something else different happens than what happened in canon, where in canon Yuji immediately went for the Black Flash, in this timeline, he had a little bit of a thought. A little bit of a thought because he noticed that Toto got hit by the technique, got hit by the sure hit of the domain. So during this small time when the domain was going off, Yuji had to think about his decision to not use Shrine. If Yuji had used Shrine, would Maito would already be dead? How dare he be so selfish and care so much about his emotions that he ended up making Toto get hit by a domain? As Toto then swapped his own places with Yuji, and Yuji landed another Black Flash right on Mahito. However, this Black Flash was similar to the first one that he casted, as Yuji had landed even more cleaves directly on Mahito's body. But even more than that, these cleaves were even more potent than the ones in comparison to before. After all, not just did Yuji just land a Black Flash, which would amplify his ability to use the cleaves even further, but we know from the most recent find in the manga that the more and more Yuji gets adjusted to cleave, the better output that it will get, mainly because the real reason why it's so weak right now in comparison to what it could be is because it's a freshly awakened technique. As it was then, Mahito awakened into his true form, now facing against a Yuji that was willing to use cleave and dismantle. Mahito knew that he went too far in that moment. He wanted to break Yuji, but he didn't succeed in breaking Yuji. Instead, he succeeded in getting Yuji over this fear of becoming another Sukuna, over the fear that was holding him back. So he needed to take Yuji out and now before he could become a threat to himself. However, Mahito couldn't help but feel excited and happy for this, as the rival, the man who had stunned his way his entire life, the man who was able to push him this far, had now awakened himself and was growing at the same time. This was going to be the true ultimate battle to see who would be around the next 1000 years, humanity or curses, with both of them pushing each other to their utmost limits, just continuing to grow and now being reborn in these moments. As the two of them begin their little hand-to-hand -hand scuffle at first, but there is a slight difference from now in comparison to canon, where every time Yuji blocks a strike from Mahito, he takes a slight moment to grab onto Mahito's arm, to grab onto a part of Mahito's body, and lands a cleave right on his body. Now, these cleaves do not do that much damage to Mahito, however, there is something that Mahito was able to notice the more and more they fought. The more and more cleaves that Yuji had landed, the deeper and deeper the cuts got. Now, it wasn't deep enough to bypass the armor, but with time, this would become a problem, especially considering the weakened state of Maito's soul in the current moment, as the both of them were growing as fighters. However, Yuji could also acknowledge something about the two of them fighting right now. If he had time, if the two of them were to fight at full HP, there was a chance that Yuji had that he could win. There was a chance if he had his full stamina right now, considering how he is growing in comparison to how Maito is growing. However, Yuji was already in a weaker state than Mahito, as Maito had directly said himself that he was at 10% of his soul HP. Now, yes, Maito had been hit by two blocks flashes, but Yuji was already quite weakened as well. So Yuji ended up coming to the result that he would need to hit Maito with another Black Flash and then cleave and dismantle combo to finally tear away Maito right from this armor and tear Mahito away from this earth. As Mahito believed that if he focused his curse energy to the front of his body, to the side that he was going to attack Yuji with, the side that he thought that Yuji would land the Black Flash on, it would be game over, which under a normal circumstance, this plan would have worked. Until he heard the voice of a man, the voice of a man that he had fought was out of this battle, which was Toto. And with the adrenaline rushing through Mahito's head, he ended up being tricked by Toto's trick, and he believed that Yuji was about to teleport right behind him, however instead in that moment, Yuji went for the exposed part of his body, with Yuji landing a black flash on Mahito, resulting in the armor itself being torn away from Mahito's very body and being destroyed. However, in this moment, Yuji did something else. Yuji grabbed Mahito's two hands and used cleave on both of his arms, destroying those arms the very arms that he had used to transfigure so many. In that moment, Mahito did try and run away. Mahito tried to run away from Yuji, but it was to no luck. It was to no avail, as Mahito ended up stumbling even faster than he did originally, mainly because of the fact that Mahito was even more damaged. Not just was Mahito out of transfigured humans and out of curse energy, he did not have arms anymore. He was that much more injured, as it was then Yuji moved his hand onto Mahito's leg, destroying his leg with cleave. And in that moment, Yuji was about to try and finish off Mahito, try and cleave Mahito apart, try and destroy Mahito's body. However, unfortunately for Yuji, in that moment, he was slammed into the ground, believed to have fallen through a hole, but he didn't know what had just happened, as Kenjaku had approached them.
Kenjaku had approached the two of them and did not waste any time, choosing to immediately use cursed spirit manipulation on Mahito. Seeing Mahito's weakened state, he could tell that Mahito could die at any moment, and this could be bad. In truth, he wasn't even sure if Mahito in this type of state could use Idol Transfiguration for his goals, for his plans of starting the Kelman games. However, he would end up finding out pretty soon. Worst case scenario, he could just use a Binding Vow in order to actually make it work. However, in that moment, Kenjaku did also have to admit something else. He was actually proud at how fast Yuji was developing. Sure, yeah, he had a lot of expectations for Yuji, but Yuji was exceeding those expectations considering he had already awoken Shrine. However, unlike canon where Yuji was basically knocked to the ground, instead Kenjaku was a little bit curious, mainly because of the fact that Yuji had actually defeated Mahito a little bit earlier than he did in canon as well. So Kenjaku began to spawn a bunch of cursed spirits for Yuji to fight. After all, many hands make light work. And despite the fact that Yuji was able to destroy most of them with punches as well as grabbing them with cleave, it wasn't enough. He ended up being thrown to the ground eventually by a couple of them and forced onto the ground, with Kenjaku being impressed enough for now with Yuji's progress. Before it was then, Kyoto High entered into the scene, followed of course by Choso himself as well as everybody else, following into the scene and battling against Kenjaku. However, Urame in this timeline is actually a little bit impressed as well at the fact that Yuji had ended up awakening Shrine, with basically the rest of Shibuya going the exact same, with Kenjaku leaving after spawning in several millions curses in order to start the Culling Games and starting the Culling Games successfully with Maito's curse technique. However, in this timeline, the higher-ups want Yuji dead even more than in comparison to before, as now they are very much aware of the fact that Yuji has access to Shrine, that Yuji has awakened Sukuna's curse technique. So not just was Yuji a threat for having Sukuna inside of him, but Yuji was also a threat because he wielded Sukuna's curse technique. This ends up with special grade sorcerer Yuda Akotsu being sent to hunt down Yuji Itadori. Now Yuda Akotsu was also aware of the fact that Yuji had awoken Shrine. Furthermore, Naoya also was sent out on his own desire in order to find Megami and Yuji, in order to eliminate Yuji as well as eliminate Megami, the both of them deciding to go out. However, this is when a slight change to the timeline is made. During the time where Yuji and Mahito had battled, it was at the peak of nighttime. However, during the time where Yuji had battled against Yuda Akotsu, we can see that it is daytime. The main reason that we can see it's daytime and the sun is rising is because at the end of the anime, they show that it's actually daytime when Yuji is luring away the cursed spirits. After that is when the Yuda Akotsu battle happens, which means several hours had passed of Yuji and Choso effectively hunting down cursed spirits. The reason why this is important is because Yuji is going to be somewhat focused on breaking in cleave and mantle into his tool set. He wants to be better with it. Now Shrine was very useful against Mahito, but he can sense that he had just awakened it and it was nowhere near the level that his body could feel was where Sakuna's was at. Now of course he did vow to himself to never use it on humans, to never use it on a human life, but he was going to use it on every single cursed spirit they ended up finding, as that was his purpose in the world, to hunt down and kill cursed spirits. So if each time the two of them had fought a cursed spirit, Yuji made sure in particular to keep using cleave and dismantle on them, to progress the technique further and further, and as a result of that Yuji ended up being even better with cleave and dismantle, even starting to actually utilize dismantle. As Shoso couldn't help but notice the fact that Yuji was a demon god in comparison to what he was before. Not just was his curse energy control massively superior in comparison to what it was, but now Yuji had access to a curse technique, and that curse technique was only growing more and more. Yuji had added control and finesse to his curse energy, but he had also added a curse technique, a fine blade that he would keep sharpening more and more to eliminate every single curse that they would end up finding. However, this is when Yuda Akotsu and Naoya both end up finding Yuji and Choso, and the battle ends up going the exact same, mainly because of one important aspect, and that is Yuji's vow to never use Shrine on a human life. Furthermore, part of Yuji is already going to be holding back against Yuda like in canon, mainly because he was debating on whether he should let himself die or not. However, he does also almost end up using Cleave on Rika, however, Yuda quickly stabs Yuji and then uses RCT on him to bring him back, doing that entire trick while also knocking out Choso. So the entire explanation of the Culling Games, as well as the Hakari meetup arc go the exact same, with of course Megami and Yuji having their entire discussion as well, and the two of them choosing to go into the Tokyo Barrier together. eventually resulting in Yuji Itadori battling against Higuruma Hiromi. 
However, in this timeline, there is an immediate difference, as there is actually a curse technique now available to take away from Yuji Itadori, which would have ended up catching Higuruma completely off guard, mainly because of the fact that he wasn't expecting Yuji Itadori to have a curse technique. From what you can tell, Yuji was mainly fighting with curse energy reinforcement for this entire battle, so when he had taken away the curse technique, that was not at all what he was expecting. As this ended up bringing this battle to a halt, as Higuruma couldn't help but question why. Why had Yuji Itadori not used his curse technique? Based on every single sorcerer that he had battled so far, no sorcerer just hid away what their curse technique was, and he could tell there was something deeper to it for Yuji Itadori. It wasn't just Yuji Itadori being tactical, there had to be something more. After all, Yuji was an open book. As Yuji then explained what happened in Shibuya, and how Sakuna had utilized this very technique to wipe out hundreds to thousands of souls in Malevolent Shrine, wiped out several souls in his body just for fun, using the same technique of Shrine, a monstrous technique that was only made to hurt life, that was made to destroy life, something that he would vow to never use again other than against cursed spirits, the same entities that did vow to destroy life. As Higuruma began to think to himself, began to think about the fact that it wasn't just some tactical reason that Yuji chose not to use Shrine. No, it was because Yuji was afraid of becoming a monster. It was because Yuji did not want to become like Sakuna. It was because Yuji didn't want to end lives like Sakuna did. And Yuji viewed this technique as evil. Yuji viewed this technique as the same way he viewed the monster itself being Sakuna, viewing it as nothing more than something that is evil. However, Higuruma in that moment also had a flashback. After all, it was similar to how he viewed the law, how he viewed justice. At first, he thought justice was good. He thought justice was a good thing. However, several people twisted it, twisted it for their own twisted ideals. Justice had been turned from something it wasn't meant to be. Justice was made to be neutral, made to punish all equally, but then he also also remembered something else, those who had been unfairly punished by those crimes. Of course, Justice didn't know everything about the person, didn't know every single circumstance. So by extension, he came to the realization that law and order could be used for anything so long as it's in the right hand. That Higuruma had been using law and order for evil desires in the same way that Yuji Itadori had refused to use Cleave and Dismantle because he viewed it as evil. So, Higuruma decided to explain something else to Yuji, something that only Higuruma could really explain to him because no one around Yuji was experienced enough to actually know this. Of course, there was one person who was experienced enough, but that person was currently stuck inside of a box. As Higuruma then asked Yuji, alright, why don't you stop punching people? After all, the initial purpose of punching was to hurt other people, to put down the lives of other people. However, that's not why you stopped punching, is it? Sakuna's curse technique is in a similar vein. Sure, yes, Shrine had eliminated the lives of hundreds to thousands, but that was in the hands of Sakuna. That was Sakuna using it. Just as punches can mercilessly take lives, a punch can also end up being the thing necessary in order to save lives as well. Shrine is the exact same as that. After all, it's up to you how to utilize it. If you want to use it to help people, then use it to help people. But don't let how someone else use it get in the way of how you will use it. It is a tool in your arsenal, nothing more, nothing less. You are the one that will decide the fate of that tool. As that was when Higuruma deactivated his curse technique and gave Yuji back Shrine, as Yuji had proven the goodness inside of his heart, proven it by proving why he did not want to use it, because he didn't want to hurt people, a pure intention, one that had reminded him of so many faces that he had seen in the past. As Higuruma agreed to make the rules that Yuji had requested from him, as the rest of the Cullen games end up going the exact same until we get to 214. Now, while Yuji does have access to Shrine, I don't think the Angel would actually be able to tell that Yuji is Sakuna's vessel, mainly because I don't think Yuji having Shrine should make it any more or less obvious considering how little Yuji does use Shrine, and the fact that Yuji doesn't really fight anyone up to that point. And everything just seems to be going extremely well for Yuji. They were about to free Gojo. His role in all of this that he was allowed to play was about to be over, and soon he'd likely be executed for having the 15 fingers of Sakuna inside of him. Everything was just going well. However, he then heard something from Sakuna. He couldn't actually process what that word was fully on his own. However, he was knocked out, and the moment after, everything had completely changed. Sakuna was no longer in Yuji's body. He was now in the body present of his friend, Megumi Fushiguro. As it was then, Sakuna punched Yuji straight through a building, several buildings at that, knocking him out for a little bit. When Yuji woke up, he couldn't see anybody around. He was confused at what was happening until Sakuna looked down to Yuji and said, Still here, huh? 
Before it was then, Yuji in a blood rage jumped at Sakuna, pushing him through a building and causing the entire roof that he was previously standing on to be destroyed. As Yuji threw Sakuna through a building before launching out dismantles right at Sakuna, following that attack with his own physical attacks as well. As Sakuna was massively confused by all of this, of course he has seen rage boosts in the past and he was expecting Yuji to get stronger as a result of the residue curse energy inside of Yuji, this was much more powerful than what it should have been. After all, not just was Yuji's physicals a lot stronger, but also his cleave and dismantle was a lot stronger as well, as Yuji threw a slab of concrete right at Sakuna's face, following it immediately with another dismantle, while at the same time going for a punch straight on Sakuna's back. However, this then confirmed Sakuna's suspicions about who Yuji was and who Yuji's parentage truly was. This power couldn't have just been from the fact that Yuji was a vessel, there was certainly something more to it, before Sakuna landed a kick straight on Yuji's face, launching him back. Before Yuji shouted at Sakuna, questioning why can't they just live without causing suffering, why can't they just live normally? Before Sakuna launched out a dismantle of his own right on Yuji's chest, and while Yuji did try and block with his now stronger dismantles, even with the buff that he had gotten, it still ended up getting overpowered by Sakuna. As Sakuna did have to admit, he was internally a bit impressed by how far Yuji had gotten with the technique in such a short amount of time, but he did know Yuji would never be able to match him with that technique, because he wasn't Sakuna. As Sakuna then said, To me, the real question is why are you all so weak? Why do such weaklings cling so fiercely to life? How can a creature that falls apart at a touch say that it always wants to be happy? The helpless have no choice but to swallow the suffering life gives them. As Yuji challenges Sakuna to swallow his suffering, and Sakuna says to bring it before launching out a massive wave of dismantles right on Yuji's body. However, this time Yuji decides to defend himself in his own way. That way he defends himself is by launching dismantles out through his own body to try and counter slash against the dismantles that Sakuna had launched out. Now because Yuji made no indicator with his fingers, the dismantles were already going to be weaker than they would be normally. Furthermore, he wasn't as mastered as Sakuna would be. However, for some reason, Yuji's dismantles were able to tie out Sakuna's dismantles. And Sakuna was immediately confused by that. Yuji's slashes were not that powerful. Even if Yuji did get stronger from his rage, that shouldn't have made him strong enough to fight against those slashes before he felt his hand shake and he realized what was happening. Megami Fushiguro had lowered his curse energy output, while at the same time Yuji immediately landed a punch straight on Sakuna's jaw. Despite the fact that Megami was lowering Sakuna's curse energy output, it wasn't going to be enough, mainly because of one little factor. Yuji at the start of 215 was already pretty exhausted from having to fight Sakuna like that, but now Yuji had been using Dismantle several times, including a Dismantle he had to power up in order to actually make battle against Sakuna's own Dismantles. So even with Maki arriving in order to help Yuji, it isn't enough. It isn't enough to stop Sakuna and eventually Urame when Urame joins in to show up as well. As Yuji was left just to watch, left to watch helplessly as Sakuna and Urame left, with nowhere near enough curse energy to chase after them or anything of the sort. He was left to watch and feel helpless as he was laughed at by the very monster that had been in his body for so long. Despite the fact that he had awakened Shrine, despite the fact that he was more okay with using Shrine than he ever was before and felt like he was on a better path, he could ultimately do nothing but watch. Watch as one of the few friends he had left were taken away. Taken away by the very monster that had tormented him for so long and had the final laugh in the end. But then Yuji snapped himself out of this feeling of helplessness. After all, this feeling of helplessness was going to do nothing but make things worse. And he couldn't just give up that easy. After all, he knew Megami would not give up on him like that, so there's no way he was going to give up on his friend. Sakuna had decided to leave Yuji alive because they believed that Yuji Itadori was of so little value that they could laugh at him while they flew away. Believing Yuji to be of so little importance and so little of a threat that they could just leave him there, that there would be nothing Yuji could do to ever change fate. But now Yuji was determined to make sure they regret that choice, determined to kill Sakuna and he'd do anything to do so. First step though he knew would be mastering Shrine. After all, while he most definitely made progress with Shrine, it wasn't enough. The buff that he had gotten against Sakuna was not enough. He would need to be stronger. He could feel how much of a difference there was between Sakuna and himself, and he knew the next time they fought, he would not be able to rely on Megami to save him like he was able to save him this time.
Now up first, and this is probably going to be one of the most important things that I need to establish, Yuji is still going to have blood manipulation in this timeline. A bunch of people in the first video didn't actually think that Yuji was going to end up having blood manipulation, mainly because he already had shrine this early on. However, right now we have a Yuji who feels even more like he is not enough, mainly because of the fact that he has access to this technique that he had pushed so heavily, and yet even that wasn't enough to take down Sukuna. So this Yuji is probably going to be even more desperate than canon Yuji actually is right now to take out Sukuna, which is absolutely insane considering how desperate canon Yuji actually is to take out Sukuna as well, and this Yuji is probably deeper into that desperation even compared to canon Yuji. So yes, this Yuji does have access to blood manipulation. It's also a little bit debatable that this Yuji might have access to a better version of of blood manipulation in comparison to what his canon counterpart has. This is mainly because of the fact that Yuji already has experience with a curse technique, and as we can tell from both Yuda Akotsu as well as Sukuna, if you have previous experience with a curse technique, it does make it easier to use other curse techniques. Maybe. We don't fully know if that's how it works or doesn't know how that works, but from what we can tell from both of them, that might be how it works. For the sake of this video, I'm not going to apply that, and we're going to say Yuji has the same level of blood manipulation, but it could be possible that Yuji does have access to better levels of blood manipulation. So at best, Yuji's actually able to use Piercing Blood in this timeline. So this does also mean that Yuji is still going to have Simple Domain as well as all the Soul stuff that he had studied. However, his RCT is actually going to be better than what it is in canon as well. The main reason why his RCT is going to be better than in canon is because Yuji is going to use Shrine on himself constantly to train Shrine, which by extension will allow him to train his RCT because it will let him get better and better with reattaching limbs because he's healing from much more lethal blows than what he would be healing from normally. So to put the level of this Yuji into perspective, I think this Yuji when it comes to Pure Rock Curse Energy Refinement and Hand to hand combat would be stronger than the level he was at when he went to Shinjuku, but I don't think he'd be stronger than current Awakened Yuji. However, he more than makes up for that with his new mastery of Cleave and Dismantle, because he is much better at Cleave and Dismantle. So he does have much more range attacks that he's much better with because of how practiced he would be with Shrine by this point, since he's had this technique for around a month now. Overall, this Yuji is stronger than current Awakened Yuji, when factoring in everything he has, including his much more master version of Shrine. As our story resumes one week before the battle in Shinjuku happens, one week before the fated day for everyone to challenge Sukuna and Kenjaku. With Yuji and Gojo currently being present inside of a training room with each other, Gojo having brought him in while everyone else was talking about their plans that they needed to keep secret from Yuji. As during that time, Gojo properly congratulated Yuji for awakening his technique and the growth he has made in such a short period of time. He had to admit the growth of his students was truly something else, but then he told Yuji the real reason he brought him here. He wanted to have a sparring match with Yuji, and that was what they were going to spend all day doing. The point of the sparring match was quite simple in Gojo's mind. While he believed that there was no chance that Cleave and Dismantle could bypass his barrier, other than maybe in a domain, he wanted to be ready and he wanted to know how Cleave and Dismantle felt so he could prepare prepare for that. And sure, while Yuda Akotsu could potentially do this as well, Yuda Akotsu could only offer that experience for 5 minutes at best, but Yuji on the other hand had been training and mastering this technique for so long now for the entire month time skip. He also knew how Yuji grew best, which was through combat, which was through sparring that he had seen time and time again. Whether it was with Toto, whether it was with Hanami, whether it was with Mahito, he knew Yuji grew best through fighting people. However, for obvious reasons, that ended up confusing Yuji. After all, Yuji had no way to bypass that limitless barrier. He could punch, kick, throw a dismantle, cleave, it would never land, which was why Gojo told him he'd deactivate the infinity barrier. As he said, you know, I created this barrier to be untouchable, but with time, people seem to just be finding ways to get past it, so I've been embracing that, and besides, this isn't just for me. You might be able to pick up something too, and maybe finish what you've been working on. And that was when the two of them began their spar, and at that moment he understood well just how powerful Gojo was. Of course he did know that Gojo was the strongest, he always believed Gojo was the strongest, but actually feeling it, man Gojo was strong. Not just because of his technique, but because of his skill. His amazing amount of skill, when it came to hand to hand, he was on another level, and each time Yuji landed a cleave or dismantle, Gojo could just heal it off or take it. But he could also tell Gojo's punches were unique. After all, ever since he became a sorcerer, he'd been punched by a lot of unique punches, so he got good at recognizing them. He didn't immediately catch on at first, though. It wasn't the first time he got hit, the second, or even the fifth, but he was able to catch on to the fact that Gojo was using his curse technique in his punches, which ended up sparking another idea in Yuji's head, which Gojo could see and that caused Gojo to smile as well. 
which led to the two sparring for hours for the entire day. However, Gojo ended up winning every single sparring match, every single one. However, Yuji could feel that he was getting a bit better, a bit more control over himself. However, even with all these, there was something that did bother him. He couldn't access the flames that Sakuna could access, and he was questioning why. He made a lot of progress with this technique, yet he was never able to feel the same flames that Sakuna had used on Maharaga and Jogo. As Gojo then told him he would help Yuji figure that out after he beat Sakuna. As then we flash forward to the present, with Gojo cut in half and Tsukashimo turned to bits. With both Yuji and Higuruma hopping onto the battlefield as Yuji immediately starts out the battle by launching out a wave of dismantles right at Sakuna. As Sakuna then immediately said good, but not good enough, before launching out a slash right at Yuji's multiple waves of slashes, just to send the message that all Sakuna needed was one slash to equal out the mass amount of progress that Yuji had made. However, one of the slashes actually ended up hitting the ground not near Sakuna, while the other slashes were countered by Sakuna and equaled out. But the entire purpose of this wasn't actually to launch it as an attack at Sakuna, but to make a smoke screen, so Yuji could disappear in the smoke and immediately land a punch on Sakuna. However, this punch was blocked, but even with it being blocked, Sakuna felt a vibration in his body. As that vibration did confuse him, but before he could even have enough time to think on that, Yuji immediately pulled what he pulled against Mahito, which was grabbing Sakuna's arm and using cleave that was blocking his punch. Of course, that cleave did not do a significant amount of damage to Sakuna at all, but Sakuna did notice that, that cleave did a little bit more damage than what he was expecting. Maybe he did underestimate how much Sakuna had grown as a rope wrapped around one of his hands as well, before Higuruma casted a domain expansion with himself, Yuji, and Sakuna present inside the domain. Now here is where we get into a little bit of a crossroads, mainly because of the fact that they can't pull off the same plan that they pulled off in canon, mainly because in this what if Higuruma never actually ended up casting his domain for a second time on Yuji. Which means the Shibuya trial never ends up happening. However, I do think no matter what the trial actually ends up being, that Sakuna is at least going to get confiscation happen to him. The main reason is because Sakuna really wants to see the Executioner's Sword, so he's just going to admit himself as guilty. So I also think that Sakuna would end up calling a retrial if necessary, and that would be what ends up getting the Executioner's Sword. So yeah, we're just going to say Higuruma does end up confiscating Kamutoke while also having the Executioner's Sword. As right after Kusakabe, Ino, and Choso all arrive, with Kusakabe quickly activating Simple Domain in order to move in front of Higuruma and take the slashes so Higuruma himself doesn't get hit. Before Sakuna then goes out of his way to acknowledge the fact that they have all leveled up their fundamentals in Curse Energy Strengthening. As well as the fact that Simple Domain was capable of weakening Sakuna's Curse Technique, though not to the same degree of what Domain Amplification would have done. Before it's then, Sakuna challenges Yuji to a race, as he then immediately goes out of his way to impale Choso with both of his arms, as Ino would immediately go for an attack straight on Sakuna's head, while at the same time Yuji would launch out two dismantles straight at Sakuna's leg. However, Sakuna is still too quick to counter, as he immediately throws out a slash of his own, resulting in that slash countering out Yuji's two slashes and hitting both Kusakabe and Yuji. Before it's then, Sakuna grabs Higuruma and throws him away from the battlefield while also landing a punch straight on his jaw, as he immediately chases after Higuruma, with Yuji chasing after him. As Yuji then tried to launch a dismantle into the ground in order to try and launch himself forward, and while this did end up helping his momentum and speed a little bit, it wasn't enough to catch up to the absolute speed demon that was Sakuna. This results in the first half of Higuruma versus Sakuna going the exact same, with Higuruma eventually awakening domain amplification and Sakuna calling out to Higuruma by his name. As Yuji then tries to make an opening for Higuruma to land a hit by launching out a wave of slashes right at Sakuna. However, Sakuna in that moment vanishes away from the slashes, not even entertaining them by sending his own slash back at them, with him catching Yuji's hand and using his other hand to place his hand right on Yuji's gut. Before it's then, Sakuna calls him a boar as he immediately uses Cleave right on his side entirely, destroying his stomach and side while launching him away. Even though Yuji ended up healing himself faster than he did in canon, even though Yuji had a stronger range attack he could launch out being dismantled, it didn't matter. Even though Higuruma could awaken reverse curse technique, it didn't matter. He ultimately ended up dying. And this death, the moment that the Executioner's Blade faded away, hit hard for Yuji. After all, this was the man who had brought him out of the state he was previously in. This was the man who had convinced him that it was okay to use Shrine on people, that Shrine wasn't an evil technique, just it had an evil user in Sukuna. Sukuna, the one who had now taken away Higuruma from him, taken away another person that Yuji had considered a friend. As Yuji then blocked Sukuna's strikes before Sukuna kicked Yuji away, as he then launched two slashes right out at Yuji. However, Yuji ended up healing off those slashes. 
As Sukuna was now stuck in a trance, thinking about how much Yuji had improved, and how much this actually annoyed him. Not just that Yuji had managed to learn reverse curse technique, but he was skilled with it, but he also had managed to improve his curse energy strengthening, and that his shrine had gotten much better as well. Before his thoughts then went to Higuruma, and himself questioning if Higuruma's death disappointed him, as he then reminded himself of his own ideals, of his own ideals that he lives the way he desires to until the day he dies. If he wants to eat, he will eat. If he sees an eyesore, he'll kill it. And if it entertains him, he will throw it a bone. He lives how he chooses to live, and if people are unable to measure up to that, then you have to blame yourself. So we believe that he shouldn't have been irritated. He shouldn't have been irritated over Higuruma's death, unless over the millennium he had changed. And in that moment, he was able to see who was the crux of all of that. The brat that was currently standing in front of him. Sakuna had fought a countless amount of battles, battles of people who were more experienced than Yuji was, more powerful than Yuji was, and with amazing techniques, and yet none of them affected him in the same way that Yuji did. And that was because none of them possessed the same unbreakable ideal like Yuji did. To him, he could never understand their ideals. To him, it seemed like their ideals were nothing more than dying wishes, and yet he couldn't deny the fact that Yuji had an ideal to kill Sakuna, one that was unbreakable. After all, he had shared a body with Yuji for so long. And he knew better than anybody that every single time you broke Yuji down, his soul would get back up. This unbreakable resolve was something Sukuna could not deny. After all, Yuji had nothing else special about him. The most notable thing Yuji had going for him was the fact that he had access to Sukuna's technique, that he had access to a technique he wasn't even born with. And yet, Yuji was able to rival him on nothing but ideals and wills, which was something that made Sukuna feel deeply unpleasant, something that Sukuna very much did not like, as Sukuna had believed that he had surpassed ideals, that Sukuna was no longer bound by ideals, and yet he could see someone in front of him, someone who directly represented the potential that he could be wrong, holding his very technique itself and being fueled by nothing but sheer will. While Sukuna loathed his ideals, loathed those ideals that made him human, Yuji was standing on those ideals. Right now, they were two opposites of the same coin. So that was what caused Sukuna to make his decision. That he was going to break Yuji's will, break Yuji's ideals to bits. Something he would never do for someone normally, but Yuji was the exception for those unbreakable ideals. Before it was then, a new rule was added to the calling games, one that gave Sukuna the full authority to start the merger, as Sukuna consumed Tengen. And it is then right after Yuda Kotsu and Rika hop into the battlefield, with Yuda Kotsu activating his domain expansion and the battle going the exact same until Yuji Itadori joins in the battle inside of Yuda Kotsu's domain expansion. With Yuji starting the fight by landing two punches right on Sakuna's arm, however, Yuji is quick enough to land a third punch, but this third punch is a little bit more unique, because this time he had actually tried to engulf his hands in dismantle which ended up making the punch do even more damage to Sukuna in comparison to before. However, it didn't actually lower Sukuna's output, as this was something Yuji was trying to do since the beginning of this fight, if not even before this. This was the idea that Yuji had gotten when he was sparring with Gojo and saw Gojo's blue fists, and it was proven to be fully possible when he saw the way that Yuda Akotsu's slash was blocked by Sukuna, which was by Sakuna covering his hands in little slashes. So instead, Yuji was going to try and integrate this into his hand-to-hand -hand style. And now that his body had directly felt it, he just needed to make sure he could land enough hits with this new technique, just to make sure it became second nature to him. As Rika then tried to slam her fist right down on Sakuna, but Sakuna ended up dodging. However, even though Sakuna ended up dodging, he got hit by Yuda Akotsu's technique, resulting in Shikigami slashing at his back. And in that moment, they were really able to feel just how much damage Gojo had left behind on Sukuna. After all, thanks to his fight against Gojo, he was unable to expand his domain expansion. The effects of his reverse curse settings had remained sluggish, and at this point, his total amount of curse energy matched that of Yuda Akotsu. Furthermore, Sakuna also needed to maintain using Hollow Wicker Basket, which rendered him completely unable to use the world bisecting Dismantle. However, even more than that, Yuji with every single one of his punches was able to weaken Sakuna's curse energy output as well as weaken the harmony between his soul and Megami's soul. As that was when Rika threw Yuji at Sakuna, as Yuji clinged onto Sakuna's arm. But this time Yuji actually had something special in mind. As Yuda Akotsu had used Curse Speech to tell Sakuna to not move, Yuji had activated Cleave right on Sakuna's arm. However, this time, the cleave had a very different effect in comparison to normal, because not just was the cleave damaging, this cleave also ended up weakening Sakuna's output, which this ended up catching Sakuna completely off guard, mainly because of the fact that Yuji had used cleave in the battle beforehand, but he had chosen not to actually attack his arm, but that was when Sakuna had a memory. 
Makwa Manito tried to use Idol Transfiguration on Yuji for the second time, and then Sakuna landed a slash on Mahito. As Sakuna realized right in that moment that that gave away that it was possible for his slashes to land a hit on the soul. And since Yuji was already using the same logic that he had used against Mahito to hit Mahito's soul in order to shake Sakuna's soul, it was only natural Yuji would figure out a way to make it apply to Shrine as well, when Sakuna had already displayed it was possible for Shrine to do that. Furthermore, he also remembered that Cleave was the first thing that he had actually utilized against Mahito when he first awakened Sakuna's curse technique, so it was only natural that Shrine would be capable of doing this as well. Before Yuda Kotsu had used Fin Ice Breaker to launch Sakuna back, leading to Rika comboing with that by slamming Sakuna into the ground as both Yuji and Yuda rushed at Sakuna. And while Sakuna did launch out a wave of dismantles at both Yuji and Yuda, it ended up launching them back, but not as much in comparison to before. The wounds were not as deep in comparison to before as well. As the wounds were very quickly healing on the both of them, with Sakuna questioning what they had been up to for the past month. As this was when Yuji and Rika decided to begin to lay pressure into Sakuna, with Yuji going for two dismantle amped punches straight on Sakuna's arms, while at the same time Rika had gone for a punch straight on his other arm. Before Yuda Akotsu using Clairvoyance was able to predict the future on Sakuna, and it allowed him to land his own cleave right on Sakuna. However, this cleave was actually Yuji's usage of cleave and not Sakuna's usage of cleave. The reason why it's Yuji's usage of cleave and not Sakuna's usage of cleave that Yuda copied is because of the fact that he, they don't have to risk Rika eating a Sakuna finger and risk what could potentially come with that. Of course we know in canon that there would be no risk mainly because Rika is not a person so Sakuna cannot manifest inside of Rika since Rika is kind of like is a weird territory of curse in Shikigami but basically there's not enough of a soul for Sakuna to manifest inside of Rika. It's better to not have to take that risk so they just copy it from Yuji instead. This also does allow them to keep the secret that they actually have Sakuna's other finger, rather than Sakuna knowing about the fact that they have that finger. As it was then Yuji and Yuda began to bombard Sakuna with attacks. Yuji went for a punch straight on Sakuna's jaw, while at the same time Yuda Akotsu ended up going for a strike straight on the stomach. The two's moves were in near perfect sync, which wasn't a surprise considering how well Yuji was when it came to fighting with people, as Yuji kneed Sakuna straight in the face while also grabbing onto his head, but immediately after performing that move, he ended up using cleave on Sakuna's head through both his hand as well as his knee. The cleave wasn't strong enough to go through Sakuna's head, however it was strong enough to shake up Sakuna's soul and weaken Sakuna's output even more. Stack that with the hits that Yuji had already been landing, and Sakuna's output was in quite a bad place at that current moment. However, Sakuna then went immediately for cleaving Yuji's entire chest, but Yuji ended up spitting up some blood in Sakuna's eye. Before Yuji then healed himself and coated his leg in dismantle in order for him to land a kick on Sakuna. As the slashes were launched out from his leg, even though Sakuna had blocked the strike, resulting in Sakuna being launched even further back and even harder straight into Rika's punch. However, unknowingly to Yuji, he had tipped his hand to how his abilities worked to Sakuna. Before it was then, Sakuna released Hollow Wicker Basket as Rika and Yuji both went for holding down Sakuna's arms, while Yuta at the same time took Sakuna's tongue straight out. And while Sakuna did try and launch out a wave of slashes at Yuta in order to launch him away, his slashes were weakened to such a point he was barely knocked back. However, this was when Yuji decided to show off that he had blood manipulation via using the blood he had made earlier in order to blind Sakuna, allowing Yuta to cut off the other hand. And then after that, Rika held Sakuna down as Yuji went for a punch on Sakuna's gut. This made to be a soul-infused punch with even more curse energy in comparison to normal in order to wake up. After all, the level of control that Sakuna had on the soul was much more in the gutters. Yuji had completely undone the process of the bath by this point and how suppressed Megami's soul actually was at least temporarily. However, in spite of all of that, in spite of all the effort that both Yuji and Yuda had put in and how much more they had drastically weakened Sakuna's soul and weakened the level of control he had, it was still not enough. Not because of the strength of Sakuna's soul, but because of one thing they could not plan for, because of one thing they could never plan for, which was how broken Megami truly was by this point. Before Yuda Akotsu was then cut in half, followed by a stab from Maki's soul split katana right into Sakuna's chest. It didn't take much time at all for Yuji to finish healing the wound. After all, he became much more familiar with the damage that Shrine could cause with what he had been doing over the one month time skip in order to train his reverse curse technique. Yuji still felt the determination he felt to save Megami, but he realized in that moment he couldn't just talk to him. Talking to Megami wasn't an option anymore because of how depressed he truly was and how much Sakuna had done to break him. They'd have to go with the second plan, which was forcing Sakuna in a similar state to the detention center. A state where Sakuna would be knocked out and causing enough damage to him so they could force the finger out 
out through Hana's technique and purged it through that. But he knew it would be harder than he thought because Megami wasn't going to fight alongside them. He also was in a hurry though, as he knew better than most that despite how much they had done to weaken Sukuna, fighting him alone was not an option. Even though he knew Maki was strong, Maki would need as much support as possible. And while Yuji and Choso tried to get over there as fast as they could, they could see the sparks of black in the distance. Sakuna had now landed a black flash on Maki, resulting in Maki taking quite a bit of damage and them getting pushed back on the bridge. But she was still standing and still awake. She had to admit she was thankful for all the weakening to Sakuna's soul that Yuji had done so far, through his punches and cleaves. She knew though she couldn't take another one of those black flashes. She needed a bit of time to heal, but there would be none against Sakuna. That was until... Kusakabe arrived and realized what he'd need to do. He needed to give Maki a chance to heal and hold off Sakuna, but there was no way he could do it alone. Fortunately though for him, he wasn't alone, as from under the bridge a piercing blood got fired towards Sakuna, one that Sakuna was able to dodge with relative ease. However, that was exactly what they wanted, because at the same time, Yuji quickly took a chance to land right on Sakuna's back and land a punch engulfed in dismantles right onto the center of his back, launching him down the bridge. This gave Maki enough time to move back so she could heal for now, as Sakuna felt the weakening effect from Yuji's fists on his soul. However, that caused Sakuna to smirk a bit, as it confirmed one of his suspicions. But now, Yuji, Choso, and Kusakabe were all facing off against Sakuna, but they had a bit of an advantage. So long as Yuji was here, the amp Sakuna would get through his RCT and through the Black Flash didn't mean anything because Yuji could just cleave it away. Yuji would cleave away any amp he got and would destroy any bit of output that Sakuna would hope to regain through the Black Flash. Kusakabe was able to notice the fact that Yuji had awakened a new application of Dismantle. After all, he had trained with Yuji, so he knew what Yuji was trying to do when he and Gojo had the little training session, and how Yuji had originally failed to engulf his fists in Dismantle, but now he had figured out how to use Dismantle on his fists like gloves, which did make him proud, but he was also a little bit worried because of that, as a thought went through his head to question if this application can target the soul. Similar to how Cleave was capable of targeting the soul, he wasn't actually sure if Yuji's Dismantle was capable of targeting the soul yet. However, Kusakabe for now silenced those thoughts. Right now, those thoughts of doubt were not going to help them, as Kusakabe was the one who led the charge, by activating and expanding the range of his simple domain. Through doing this, he was able to move with blinding speeds in front of Sakuna and immediately land a large amount of slashes with his katana on Sakuna. It truly was amazing what Kusakabe was capable of, as Kusakabe did not have a cursed technique, but he had mastered simple domain and its applications to such a point that he was able to ascend and reach the level of the strongest grade 1. The damage was building up on Sakuna's body, which was only going to get better and better for them and worse and worse for Sakuna the longer they continued, as Kusakabe took that moment to launch Sakuna right off the bridge before it was followed by an attack from Choso. Because that was when Choso clapped his hands together in order to use the piercing blood and fire it right at Sakuna. After all, Sakuna was midair. Sakuna should have no way to dodge this attack. At least that was what Choso had believed based on everything he knew about Sakuna. But Sakuna did have a way, as he ended up hopping off air, which caught the both of them off guard, as there was no way for either of them to be able to predict that Sakuna had such an ability that allowed him to hop off of air. However, there was one person who wasn't caught off guard by such an ability, and that person was Yuji Itadori himself. He had seen Sakuna do this when Maki and him battled a month ago, so this was something he was already aware of as he hopped behind Sakuna in that moment, using Cleave on the ground to make an explosion to launch himself upwards with a bit more speed, and a similar method to Sakuna's spiderweb technique that he had used against Yuji and Maki. Before it was then followed up by a punch he landed straight on Sakuna's side as he attempted to grab onto Sakuna's arm and land a cleave. The key word though being attempt, as a moment before Yuji could grab Sakuna, Sakuna spun mid-air and lifted up his hand like a finger gun to shoot Yuji right back into the ground with a dismantle, as Sakuna himself landed. As he explained to them what Yuji's weakness was, Yuji could not use dismantle to target the soul, but Yuji also couldn't immediately use dismantle after cleave. There was always a slight delay of around 5 seconds, which he was able to figure out through the fact that Yuji wasn't always using his dismantle with his fists, and it was true. Despite how much he had trained and gotten better, he couldn't immediately swap between slashes like someone like Sakuna could. But during that explanation, several supernovas rose out around Sakuna. Supernovas that Choso had gotten to set up during Yuji and Sakuna's mid-air scuffle with each other, that Choso activated while Sakuna was going on his speech about Yuji's flaw of his technique. Sakuna couldn't help but admit he was a little bit impressed that they had actually caught him talking like that and took advantage of that. No matter, this wouldn't be in much of an issue for him. This time though, Yuji and Kusakabe had a bit of a different plan of attack, because they were going to go out together this time rather than Kusakabe leading and then Yuji being the final move. No words need to be exchanged between the student and master, as Yuji's hand this time were completely engulfed in dismantles, as Sakuna covered two of his hands with his own slashes in that moment, almost as if to tell them to bring it on. 
as the battle immediately started with Kusakabe attempting to land a slash on Sukuna's left side, while Yuji went for a dismantle and punch on Sukuna's right side. However, Sukuna was very quick to block the both of the strikes. While Kusakabe was launched back, Yuji was not. He was able to equal out the slashes thanks to how much of Sukuna's output had been weakened and landed another punch on Sukuna's body. Following that punch, Yuji launched a dismantle right at Sukuna, as at the same time, Sukuna delivered a kick on Yuji, launching him back as the dismantle hit Sukuna. Though during the launch, Choso was very quick to play support, as Choso created a blood platform behind Yuji. Which that was also when Kusakabe went for his own strike, trying to land another barrage of slashes on Sukuna, but Sakuna broke the katana, staring at him with a confident grin. After all, the same trick wouldn't work twice on Sukuna. Or at least that's what he believed they were going for, but Yuji very quickly took advantage of the fact that Sakuna was confident in the moment. The way that he did this was by going for Sakuna's back, and using cleave on Sakuna's back through both of his hands, targeting Sakuna's soul in that moment in order to weaken his output even further. While they were not as strong as an attack in comparison to his dismantle and punches, they were still good enough when it came to weakening Sakuna's output and even better than his dismantle and punches at that. But Sakuna had his own way to counter very fast, as he then said Scale of the Dragon, but he didn't actually complete the full chant for the World Cutting Slash. Instead, he launched out two amped up dismantles towards Kusakabe and Yuji in order to launch them away. And while the slashes were painful, in Yuji's mind, that wasn't the main thing that he was focusing on, as Yuji realized that this wouldn't be enough. He had managed to grow quite a bit over the one month time skip, but it still wasn't enough. He still had flaws in his cleave, and he still had flaws in his dismantle, something that Sakuna managed to exploit when fighting the both of them. Sure, they had managed to change their strategy in order to work alongside that, which is why having Kusakabe there was so important, but this wouldn't work forever. They needed to remove the delay between it entirely, and they needed to make sure that dismantle could target the soul. That was what Yuji was trying to break into it now. To make it so Dismantle could target the soul, so his Dismantle Amp Fists would be able to serve as both something that could do damage as well as something that could hurt the soul and weaken Sakuna's output. After all, there was a reason why it was easier to target the soul of Cleave than Dismantle, and that was because Cleave was primarily made for close quarters combat and gripping onto somebody, but it also had the ability to target the body and the curse energy in the body, so it was just a matter of targeting the soul that was clinging to the curse energy. However, he couldn't do that as easily with Dismantle, but Dismantle offered him a lot more options. But Yuji's internal reflection was interrupted very quickly as suddenly Sakuna's hands were sliced right off, leaving him with only one of the hands as they were sliced off by the soul split katana by Maki Zenin, the ghost of the Zenin clan that had now finished healing. With Sakuna now only having one hand, while at the same time a hard hitting punch landed on Sakuna's back, Miguel have also arrived with LaRue standing next to Choso, as after the two of them had landed their strikes, a massive hand slammed Sakuna right into the ground before vanishing. This battle was now a 6v1 of Maki, Yuji, Miguel, Kusakabe, Laru, and Choso, all against Sukuna. As Sukuna took a moment in order to assess each of their threat levels, despite everything, he considered Maki the greatest threat due to the difficulty he was experiencing with healing from her wounds with that blade. Then Yuji thanks to his ability to weaken the soul. After that was Kusakabe, who he had to admit was stronger than he initially expected. Then Laru, who was a more of a mystery card. And finally Choso, someone he knew he could eliminate at any point. However, that was not the only thing Sakuna had to face either. He knew there was still the woman in the distance with their sacrificial birds. Furthermore, there was the annoying brat who could teleport as well. He needed to eliminate the both of them whenever he could. The teleporting child would likely be easier to eliminate though. As the battle started with Yuji releasing a wave of dismantles, but the wave of dismantles he released had two targets. They were closer to the ground in order to cause more rubble and use the ground as a smoke wave. Of course, for most of the sorcerers, Sakuna would still be able to detect their curse energy, but it was Maki who would be able to take advantage of this, due to the fact that Maki had no curse energy, as Sakuna quickly moved out of the way of the dismantles coming at him. After the wave of smoke, several blood spikes would rain down from the sky on Sakuna. Choso was now aiming to go for large amounts of attacks rather than one fast attack. As he had been able to see, Sakuna could dodge piercing blood quite easily. In spite of that though, Sakuna began to flip, repeatedly dodging the blood spikes that were coming at him. This was when Kusakabe and Miguel both went for Sakuna's sides. As both Kusakabe and Miguel went for a strike on Sakuna's side, Sakuna however was able to block both of their strikes, but Miguel in particular had a hard strike, resulting in Sakuna being launched back a bit. This was when Yuji quickly went for Sakuna's back, using Kusakabe and Miguel's strike to his advantage as he landed a dismantling golf punch right on Sakuna to launch him forward into another strike, going to try and put Sakuna in a constant combo and not give him enough time to breathe or be able to cast anything. However, while Sakuna was annoyed from Yuji's strike, he was able to figure out what Yuji's new goal was right now. Sakuna simply decided that he'd kill everyone Yuji cares about and Yuji before Yuji could figure out how to make Dismantle target the soul. 
However, Yuji ended that train of thought from Sukuna as Yuji quickly closed the distance between them in order to land another one of those punches on Sukuna's chest while Kusakabe and Miguel were preparing to go in for another combo on Sukuna. As the four of them entered into a hand-to-hand -hand combat clash, with Sukuna repeatedly managing to block strikes from Kusakabe and Miguel while making sure to dodge Yuji's strikes, Sukuna was starting to get adjusted to their rhythm before he very quickly placed his hand right onto the crown and activated Cleave Spiderweb, resulting in Yuji, Miguel, and Kusakabe all being launched back from the explosion caused through Cleave Spiderweb. This was the opening Maki had been waiting for, the opening where Sukuna was looking down at the ground and paying attention to the free opponents that were in front of him. So, Maki tried to take advantage of that. Maki tried to go down from the heavens in order to stab the soul split katana right through Sukuna's chest in order to cause another wound that would be incredibly difficult for Sukuna to heal in his current state. However, this was exactly what Sukuna wanted, mainly because this was all a trap. This was all made to be bait in order to lure Maki to attack. So, Sukuna very quickly surrounded his hand in slashes, something he knew worked, and grabbed the soul split katana from Maki. Sukuna was starting to get adjusted to their moves, he was starting to be able to predict how they would work and starting to predict how they would fight, so he was going to set himself up to take advantage of that. As it was then, Sukuna used the momentum of Maki falling in order to pull her right into a black flash that they landed on her while at the same time deflecting the soul split katana away. And while Maki was being launched away through the black flash, Sukuna immediately launched out three slashes into Maki in order to further the distance and further the amount of damage that was landed on her. Sakuna could feel it though. His reverse curse technique output was returning. His curse technique output was returning. He was getting stronger and stronger now. Each black flash would only amplify him more and more and massively reduce his recovery time. It would only be a matter of time till he was back at full power. Kusakabe now had to begin reassessing their plan. After all, if Sukuna landed more and more black flashes, it would only get worse for them, so they needed to be cautious with what their moves were. Preventing him from landing a black flash was extremely important by this point. Miguel, on the other hand, was starting to feel they've done way more than they needed to, so there was no reason he couldn't just leave after all. Yuji, though, was quick to move, as Yuji knew his role. He needed to make sure that any output that Sukuna could hope to regain would be destroyed, after all. After all, with his punches, he could end any progress he had made and send him right back to where he was before. This was when Choso did something that confused Sukuna, which was launching some of his blood onto Yuji's body. However, the reason why he did this was unknown to Sukuna. Yuji was able to figure it out pretty quickly, though, before the three of them began their battle, starting with Choso attempting to assist via landing a piercing blood on Sukuna at the same time Yuji went for a strike straight on Sakuna's chest infused with dismantle, an attack and distraction combination, something Sakuna had already seen them do several times. This would be no different, as he was able to move to dodge before a massive hand slammed in Sakuna's back, the hand of Larue, which launched Sakuna into the strikes, forcing him to get hit down to the ground. Out from the rubble though, a wave of slashes would be launched out towards Yuji, Larue, and Choso. However, Sakuna notably wasn't in the wave of rubble. Sakuna had managed to reach behind Larue and black flash Larue right in the back, towards the slashes that Sakuna had launched out at them, with a confident grin now on Sakuna's face. Yuji was able to punch away the slashes that were launched at him, but just barely. Yuji could feel that his power and skill with Dismantle had been growing even now, but it wasn't growing fast enough as he saw Sakuna land another Black Flash on Larue. Choso just barely managed to dodge the attack, and Yuji could see Choso was starting to get a bit tired. After all, by this point, Choso had fired several piercing bloods, he used Supernova several times, and the blood shards. Sure, Choso's stamina had improved a bit, but it still wasn't boundless. Yuji then rushed at Sukuna, now engaging Sukuna in hand-to-hand -hand combat. After all, he knew so long as he could land a strike, even if it was blocked, it would help them. Yuji this time though, before he made it to Sukuna, quickly placed his hand onto the ground and used Cleave Spiderweb in order to attempt to force Sakuna up into the air, which was a success. As Sakuna could see the little scissor lines appearing, knowing it would be best to avoid that, mainly because he wasn't actually too sure if this would be able to target his soul directly or not. After all, while he knew Cleave on his body could target the soul, he wasn't too sure if Cleave through the ground could target his soul. So Yuji then jumped after Sukuna, and Sakuna launched a dismantle right at Yuji. Based on what he knew, Yuji couldn't air hop after all, so this would force Yuji to take even more damage and force him to have to use even more reverse curse technique. At least that was what Sakuna believed, mainly because Choso solidified the blood in that moment that he had placed on Yuji, and had Yuji used that as a platform for him to hop to the side and move out the way of the dismantle, as Choso formed another barrier allowing Yuji to jump up and punch Sakuna straight in the jaw, causing damage through dismantle and weakening his output once again. 
but before Sukuna could counterattack, Yuji grabbed onto Sukuna and used Sukuna to launch himself over him. As he deactivated Dismantle and went for Cleave this time, he had to push himself. He had to push himself in order to force the delay to be even less time than normal, and he managed to succeed at that. He managed to make the delay 3 seconds instead of 5 seconds, as he planted both of his hands onto Sukuna's back and launched him into the ground while hitting him with the soul-slashing Cleave he had been developing. And this improvement in particular angered Sukuna. Yuji was getting better with his technique, getting better with Shrine, but it was no matter. He still wasn't anywhere close to Sukuna was on his own. He just got lucky, that was all. Yuji wouldn't have been able to accomplish any of that if he was on his own after all. But that was when Kusakabe expanded the range of his simple domain once again while activating Moonlight Veil to go for a slash on Sakuna's back while Choso at the same time launched out a piercing blood right at Sakuna, as Sakuna with one hand caught the blade while moving out the way of the piercing blood, as he then broke the Moonlight Veil katana of Kusakabe. And he was about to go for another black flash on him, but Choso's piercing blood quickly clung to Sakuna's arm, not as an attack but as blood itself. After all, even the slightest of delays can help with stopping a user from casting the Black Flash, and this delay would certainly help as Kusakabe ended up getting hit by a normal punch rather than a Black Flash. But after that strike, Yuji rushed for Sukuna while Kusakabe was launched back, and there was a focus in Yuji's eyes that was new. No, it wasn't new. It was the same feeling Sukuna had felt when Yuji had battled against Mahito, the feeling when Yuji had forced a Black Flash. Sukuna couldn't let hit it. Sakuna couldn't let that hit him or else. However, something else forced his attention. Laru's curse technique had grabbed his heart. Of course, it didn't take long at all for Sakuna to snap himself out of that, but he didn't do it fast enough, as Yuji landed a black flash on Sakuna, with the sparks of black covering the both of them and massively exceeding the both of them in size. But following the sparks of black was a wave of slashes that broke apart the bridge while causing quite a large amount of cuts to Sakuna. However, there were two things Sukuna could immediately note. Number one, the Black Flash caused a significant amount of damage to his soul, much more damage to his output than he thought it would have, but there was something else that was even more important. The Dismantle was now capable of harming his soul. Within the Sparks of Black, Yuji had now awakened and gained the ability to use Dismantle to target the soul. Choso, Kusakabe, Laru, and Miguel were all blown back by the amount of destruction that Yuji just caused with that Black Flash Dismantle combo, and Choso had a proud smile on his face for his little brother, but once the smoke cleared, Yuji nor Sukuna were no longer there, as they could see in the distance another Black Flash lands on Sukuna, just as strong if not stronger than the previous one. As Kusakabe was starting to question just how far are these kids pushing themselves up to this point, this was also when Miguel and LaRue chose to leave, mainly because they had done enough by this point, with Kusakabe and Choso going in to back up Yuji. However, it's then we return to Yuji and Sukuna. Sukuna had been launched for a building, as he had to admit that that strike to the soul did hurt a lot, a lot more than he was expecting. He realized in that moment Yuji had figured it out, how to use Dismantle on the soul while using the soul punches at the same time. Furthermore, the punch was amplified by the Black Flash, as Sukuna had to question for a moment if Yuji intended to climb to the level of Sukuna. Unfortunately though for Sukuna, he didn't have much time to question or think about anything as Yuji, with a terrifying focus in his eyes, hopped into the building right at Sukuna, moving at a blinding speed. Sukuna just barely managing to lift up his hands in order to block the punch that was coming at him, but blocking it was irrelevant as he was hit by another black flash with even more slashes, striking at the barrier between his and Megami's soul once again. As Sukuna was launched back by that strike, as burn marks formed on the ground while he was launched back, he could feel it. Megami's body was rejecting his soul now. He couldn't take more of those strikes, and he needed to get himself back on track, as he quickly launched out a wave of slashes at Yuji, trying to launch him away. However, in order to counter, Yuji lifted up his hands with slashes engulfing his hands, before he then did multiple waves of the hand, almost like he was slashing with a blade in a similar motion to that of Nanami, resulting in a wave of dismantles being launched out. The first of the slashes was enough to equal the wave of slash that Sakuna had launched out. That was how successful Yuji's dismantle had become by this point, as well as how much he had weakened Sakuna's output. All of that just from one slash, while a wave of slashes were still on the way to hit Sakuna. As Sakuna questioned for a moment if Yuji's slashes even while being launched out were actually capable of harming his soul or not, but he realized very quickly that he couldn't end up risking it. Even if they weren't, they would still end up doing damage to him either way, so he wouldn't want to risk getting hit by them. 
So he quickly slashed at the ground while jumping in order to launch himself out from the building that they were currently fighting in, but Sakuna realized too late that that was Yuji's plan, as Yuji was already on Sakuna's side before landing another black flash on Sakuna's side, punching him towards the wall. As Sakuna of course had to question if he was starting to become predictable or not, however he was able to stop himself from hitting the wall via doing a step on air, as he then quickly lifted up his hand and pushed it forward in order to launch out another wave of dismantle while chanting as fast as he could to be able to get Scale of the Dragon and Twin Meteors out, which resulted in a slash cutting through a large chunk of the building that was coming at Yuji. Despite the fact that Sakuna had lost several of his hands and the fact that he had lost his stomach mouth and he had to use cursed energy to make his heart beat, Sakuna was still able to fight to such an impressive degree, and a part of Yuji had to acknowledge that. And even though he was impressed at the combat level that Sakuna was at, it didn't hinder him one bit. As Yuji chose in that moment, instead of meeting the attack head on, he chose to launch himself out the building in order to dodge the massive dismantle that Sakuna had launched out at him. Before it was then, he landed on another building, and he took a page straight out of Sakuna's book, as he used the cleave spider web on the building as well as his own physical strength to launch himself off the building, moving with blinding speeds yet again thanks to everything that he had just used to amplify his own speed. As now, he was behind Sakuna, before punching him straight in the back, using another black flash infused with dismantle to launch him straight through the building which that strike caused Sakuna to pant quite a bit, as he did quite a bit of damage especially to his soul, as he felt his fingers once again trying to exit his system, resulting in him vomiting up five of the fingers just for a moment before he consumed them quickly. He needed to do something before he lost, because as things were going right now, he was going to lose. He hadn't landed enough black flashes to get his domain to return to him. His RCT was only going down from here. He was already weak and he only had two of his hands on his side right now, so he couldn't make hand signs. He needed to think on what there was for him to lose in exchange for binding vows. How could he win? But Yuji gave Sakuna no moment to think or strategize, as in that moment a wave of debris was launched out at Sakuna from up high. Yuji had used cleave on several pillars he had thrown at Sakuna as a way to distract him, while at the same time Yuji was rushing from him down below, as he released a wave of dismantles that was going for Sakuna as well. Sakuna decided quite fast what was more of a risk to get hit by, which was the dismantles themselves. So instead, he launched himself towards the rubble, getting hit by a few of them as he landed right in front of Yuji deciding to go for close quarters directly. Before it was then, Sakuna immediately went for a punch on Yuji and landed a black flash, allowing Sakuna to regain some of that fallen output. However, Yuji had caught the black flash, and while he was pushed back, he wasn't launched back, and he was clinging on to Sakuna's hand. Instead, in that moment, Yuji pulled Sakuna in to land another Black Flash right on the gut. Yuji was able to pick up the fact that Megami's soul was rejecting Sakuna, so he just needed to land enough Black Flashes and Dismantles to win. Furthermore, Yuji could feel with each Black Flash he was growing in power and ability. All of his abilities were getting stronger, from his Dismantle to his Cleave to his Blood Manipulation, all the way down to the control of his Curse Energy. It would only be a matter of time until Sakuna was defeated. As Sakuna was launched back, he could feel the fingers almost come out of him, and he just barely held it down this time, but Yuji was not going to let him focus on that, as he quickly rushed at Sakuna while he was launched back and landed another Black Flash on Sakuna. Yuji was in the zone right now, and his target was Sakuna. He was going to make sure that Megami was free by the end of this no matter what. He wasn't going to stop until Sakuna was dead, and Sakuna could see that determination on Yuji's face, and it was a horrifying thing to see. However, while Sakuna was distracted and trying to hold down his fingers, Yuji quickly adapted by swapping curse techniques. He quickly swapped to blood manipulation as he manipulated some of his own blood from behind himself to explode and launch himself even faster as he swapped back to shrine and punched Sakuna in the face with another black flash engulfed with dismantle as Sakuna was launched straight through a building that was cut apart while being destroyed at the same time. If it wasn't for the fact that Sakuna had landed a Black Flash previously on Yuji, he would have fully thrown up a finger or several in that moment. However, Sakuna needed a moment to breathe, but he wasn't just going to let this brat take him down that easily. So what that Yuji had now landed 8 Black Flashes and figured out how to make Dismantle target his soul? None of that would matter because Sakuna knew he would win. As it was then, Sakuna attempted to use his chance to his advantage once again, by saying Scale of the Dragon Twin Meteors, as he had a feeling that Yuji had yet to figure out how to chant yet, while a wave of slashes were launched out at Yuji, all of them being amped by the chance. Thoughts were going through Sakuna's head in that moment. Yuji was one of the stronger opponents he had fought in a long while and was pushing him heavily, but he couldn't complement that to Yuji's strength. 
After all, if it wasn't for the fact that Sukuna was a vessel, he wouldn't have had this weakness. If Yuji had fought him back in the Heian era, he wouldn't have even gotten this close. But that was a simple reality of things, but even more than that, there was another reason why he couldn't accept the strength of Yuji. He couldn't accept that Yuji had gotten himself this strong because of the fact that if he did, it would completely invalidate who he was as a person. Yuji stood at the opposite of Sukuna, one who got strong on ideals against one that abandoned their ideals for the sake of power, one who saw being a human being as completely useless. This was why Sukuna was so determined to break Yuji, to prove that he was right and that his path of doing things were right. However, that was the difference between Yuji and Sukuna in that moment. Yuji could care less about this debate between himself and Sukuna than Sukuna has believed that is going on. He could care less about justifying their own life. His one goal was to get Megami back and he was going to make sure he did. So instead of meeting the attack head on, he decided to jump out the way once again in order to avoid the strike while he rushed at Sukuna to go in for another punch to try and land another black flash. However, this was exactly what Sukuna had wanted and was hoping Yuji would go for because he read Yuji like a book, doing a similar move to what he had done before. As he casted the flame arrow, the flames of death roar forth. During this battle, Ryom and Sukuna had hit Yuji with both cleave and dismantle. While normally he would have casted his domain and wait until he could, he didn't have that choice right now. He needed to kill Yuji and fast, so he'd used his ultimate move. He could only aim his technique at one person, that one person being Yuji Itadori because of a binding vow Sukuna had placed far before the time of this battle. Rather than it being a massive explosion of flame, it would simply be a fire arrow to burn away Yuji in a similar way to what he had done to Jogo. This was the move that Yuji couldn't use yet as he had to wonder why. What was different between how Sukuna used it and how he used it? He had tried so many times to practice that technique, but he couldn't succeed. However, in that moment he needed to figure out a way around it. There wasn't enough time to dodge. There also wasn't enough time to activate Simple Domain in order to try and lessen the amount of damage that it was going to do to him. However, that was when Yuji had a flashback, back to when he had fought Choso, and Choso had hardened his blood heavily in order to block Yuji's strike. As he internally thanked his elder brother for showing him that trick, but he wasn't entirely sure if he could pull it off in that moment. However, in this moment it was all or nothing, because that was the only way he could take this technique and only take minor damage rather than taking the major amount of damage that he would take normally. As it was in that moment, blood rose out around Yuji's arm and hand that began to harden very heavily, before Yuji, with a cold and emotionless tone, said, Blood Meteorite is a technique that most blood manipulation users don't use. It is done by hardening the blood, something that is completely unnatural to most blood manipulation users. But they don't do this out of risk of suddenly developing thrombosis. However, this was a very intentional move, as Yuji had explained a part of the technique that he had just used, and by doing that, he had casted the Concealment Binding Vow, which resulted in Blood Meteorite amplifying its durability even more to clash with the already weakened Fire Arrow thanks to how weak Sukuna's output was. Now, Sakuna could have returned the favor by explaining how the fire arrow worked, by explaining the necessary conditions to activate the fire arrow, but he knew one thing. If he explained that, that might give Yuji access to the fire arrow, and he was already pretty sure the fire arrow was not going to kill Yuji, so he could not risk Yuji gaining access to that ability or else he would be a goner. However, thanks to Yuji's access to RCT, thrombosis being a risk didn't exist for him. As Yuji was pushed back by the potent power of the Fire Arrow, even with that Binding Vow in mind, it was still incredibly powerful. Even though Yuji had weakened Sukuna's output so much, it was still incredibly powerful. This was the might of the King of Curses and his ultimate move. Heavens forbid what could happen if this was used inside of a domain expansion. But Yuji was starting to understand it now, that there was something more to Sukuna's fire arrow. After all, if Sukuna could use that fire arrow beforehand, he probably would have. There is something special about how to utilize it, and he just needed to figure out what. But unknown to Yuji, he was currently capable of using the fire arrow on Sukuna, as he had already filled out the requirements. He just needed to be aware of the fact that he could right now. As Sukuna could sense Yuji still alive in that wave of smoke, as he began to think on what his next move should be. As there were two sides of Sukuna currently, there was a side of Sukuna that was absolutely despising Yuji right now. The fact that Yuji could stay alive even after that annoyed and infuriated him. However, there was a part of him that was actually having a little bit of fun with this. There was a part of him that was a bit more intrigued. 
as Sukuna in that moment decided that he would stop holding back and that he was going to go all out. Now, he couldn't access his true full power, mainly because of the fact that his output had been weakened so much, but he could at least stop holding back and go to the full power of what he would be in this current state. As out from the smoke, they could see charred blood fall off of Yuji's arms. While Yuji had some burn wounds on his arms, they had finished healing, as Yuji was now staring down at Sukuna, the two of them getting ready as Sukuna released a wave of curse energy. Not as an attack, but as a declaration that he was going to stop holding back, and while the amount was equal to that of Yuda Akotsu in the current moment, it massively exceeded the power of Yuda Akotsu. The control and the output levels, despite the fact of how weakened it had become, was absolutely massive. Sakuna had made himself a beacon, as Urame was able to feel in the distance that Sakuna had stopped holding back. However, Yuji wasn't intimidated by this at all. No, he was going to continue forward no matter what, as Yuji and Sakuna both closed the distance with each other, and they clashed fist, neither of them landing a black flash in that moment. However, both of their hands were engulfed in slashes, and as a result of that, they were able to equal each other out. This was a little trick that Sakuna had decided to copy from Yuji now, in order to make it so those slashes wouldn't hit his soul directly. After all, if using his slashes worked to block the soul split katana which was going for his soul, why wouldn't it work to block something that was going for the barrier in between his soul? As Yuji just realized that Sakuna was going to make this significantly harder for him, Yuji had not used his barrage of black flashes to his advantage. While he did put pressure on Sakuna, he gave Sakuna too much space. That would be a mistake that would not happen again, as the two of them began to repeatedly clash fists and block each other's blows. It looks like waves of sparks were filling the entire battlefield from the repeated amount of times their slashes collided with each other. Each time Sakuna attempted to land a blow on Yuji, Yuji was able to deflect it or block it properly. However, every single time Yuji had tried to land a blow, Sakuna had always managed to find a way to deflect it, whether through using slashes he launched out ahead of time, or through using his own hand-to-hand -hand combat in order to deflect it with his mastery of the skill. However, while the both of them were in the zone, neither of them were actually able to land a black flash in that moment, as the both of them ended up pushing each other back from one of their strikes. However, after that clash, Sakuna lifted up his hand, launching out a wave of dismantles right at Yuji, as Yuji dodged and moved out of the way, but Sakuna was able to predict the direction that Yuji was going to go this time, and appeared right beside Yuji. Yuji was able to fully keep up with that speed and blitz attempt though, however, he wasn't fast enough to move on time, as Sakuna placed a hand on Yuji's gut and used cleave on him right again. Now, one of the steps to launch out the fire arrow had been completed once again. All he needed to do now was hit Yuji with another dismantle. Speaking of Dismantle though, Yuji took advantage of this chance, as he engulfed his hand in Dismantle once again before punching Sakuna straight in the face and launching him back, as he had landed another Black Flash. This Black Flash resulted in Sakuna being launched back, and while he was being launched back, he ended up throwing up a total of six of his fingers before he reconsumed those fingers. He could see that the amount of fingers he was losing would be greater and greater. It was only going to be a matter of time until all of those fingers were properly rejected from his body. However, that was when a total of three crows came down from the heavens out of nowhere, attempting to use Bird Strike in order to sacrifice their lives in order to hit Sakuna. However, Sakuna was quickly able to dismantle them using a wave of dismantles that he had launched at all three of the crows. But following that wave of dismantle was a wave of blood that had landed right on Sakuna. Before the blood then hardened on his body, as he could see Choso standing on a rooftop with his hands clapped, as Choso then fired out a piercing blood right at Sakuna. As Sakuna ended up giving that an unimpressed look, mainly because of the fact that Choso had already tried this before. So why would he try this again when he had already displayed the ability that he knew how to deal with it, as Sakuna then launched out a dismantle to tie out the piercing blood. However, he was able to notice that this piercing blood was even stronger and actually able to tie out the dismantle. Sakuna was starting to think, was it that Yuji had weakened him that much? No, Choso had placed a binding vow on that technique. As you could see, both of Shoso's arms fall off. He had sacrificed his arms in order to power up the technique massively, but it clearly wasn't worth it considering the fact that Sakuna's dismantles could still equal it out. However, it was then Maki rushed for his front, attempting to go for another Soul Split Katana Slash, but Sakuna was confused at what their strategy was. Why was Maki going for such an obvious move? As Sakuna and Maki began their rematch once again. Now, while Maki wasn't fully recovered yet from the Black Flash that Sakuna had delivered to them, Sakuna was in a much weaker state, so the two of them were able to go quite even for a while, with the two of them slashing against each other repeatedly. As Sakuna was questioning why Maki went for this tactic, why would Maki go for such a direct approach rather than trying to catch him off guard by a stealth? 
However, that was when Maki told Sukuna that he was forgetting about somebody, as suddenly, in a burst of speed, Yuji had appeared right behind Sukuna, and on Yuji's face were markings, markings from Flowing Red Scale. Through the Black Flash, Yuji had been able to figure out how to use Flowing Red Scale, but he quickly deactivated the technique and swapped back to Shrine. Before it was then, the area got hotter and hotter, as in Yuji's hands, a flame began to form. Not the orange and red flame that Sakuna wielded, no. In Yuji's hands was a blue flame. A calm and controlled flame with one target, that target being Sakuna. Through the Black Flash and having some time to think on what Sakuna was doing, he was able to figure out the conditions for activating the fire arrow. As in Yuji's hands now, a blue arrow made of flames had been formed, molded as if it was clay. As the method that Sukuna used to get over the problem of it being a ranged projectile that was slow using binding vows, Yuji had another fix, and that was quite simple, as he stabbed the fire arrow right into Sukuna's back. Maki and Choso had just served as distractions in order for Yuji to finish properly healing and figure out how to use this technique. And Yuji decided that he would stab the fire arrow into him like a spear, as Sukuna was launched up into the air as a result of that, with a total of 10 of his fingers being released from his body. While the blue flames engulfed his entire body as well as attacked the inside of his body as well, he could feel it all across his body, but there was something else he was noticing in that moment. It wasn't as strong as he was expecting it to be. It hit hard, but it definitely wasn't as strong as he expected it to be. However, he realized very quickly why, as another finger was rejected from his body, and another. Yuji had placed a binding of out on his arrow, where in exchange for 90% of the physical damage that would have been delivered to his body, that was delivered to the barrier between Sukuna and Megami's soul. And Yuji's flames weren't going to leave Sukuna's body until all of those fingers were out, but that was the least of his problems. As suddenly Wee Wee had returned to the battlefield, and at the same time, he was bringing with him Hana Karesu, as the entire sky had been filled with light. Before a massive beam came down from the heavens to strike down on Sukuna, as the sky was filled with blue and yellow, it wouldn't be long until Sukuna's fingers had perished from this world, had been rejected from Megami's body, and burned away. Ryomen Sukuna was now dead. Killed and executed by the one he was careless in his attempt to execute them, as well as the one that he decided not to kill believing that they couldn't do anything, as Maki then caught Megami before they could hit the ground. At that same time, Urame had realized what had just happened. Sukuna had just been executed. Sukuna was now dead. As those words repeated in Urame's head again and again while they were battling against Hikari as Sakari declared that he would be making Urame join them soon. Which this would eventually lead into Urame's death, whether it's a 1v1 between Hikari and Urame, or it's Yuda arriving in Gojo's body, or Maki Zenin themselves finishing them off, or even Yuji or everybody else coming to jump in, Urame is just going to die. And that is the end of this what if. Now I do think it's pretty likely that Sukuna on death would have activated the merger, we just have no idea what the merger actually, or how the merger even works. So when we do find out how the merger works, I might make a bonus episode to this what if, but for now just assume the merger doesn't happen, and it's basically the good happy timeline, where they end up honoring their fallen comrades in Higuruma and Gojo. With Yuda Akatsu returning back to his body, as several of the students continue on their work as Jiu-Jitsu Sorcerers. Now some of them do end up retiring, but most of them do continue their work as Jiu-Jitsu Sorcerers, with several of them joining into Jiu-Jitsu High. Yuji in particular taking on a very similar role to that of Gojo, in order to help guide the next generation while being their protector, as he begins to master his abilities more and more, mastering the abilities of Sukuna and now being basically the exact opposite of what Sukuna was, where he helps people and helps them get stronger via using his abilities to help guide them. Now of course there is the issue of the world itself knowing about Curse Energy now, but I don't think that is too much of a threat considering how easily the military was dealt with, so I think that is eventually just going to be handled. How that could end up going is really, really hard to guess, because we have no idea how it's going to end up going in the actual JJK. So there are some interesting ways this could be written, but this is much more fanfiction-y, and would require us to write an entirely new plot for JJK after the Battle of Sukuna. However, that might come in the future, who knows? But for now, that's going to be the end of this what if, of what if Yuji Itadori had awakened Shrine early. So thank you to everyone who had supported this series, and everyone who has watched every single part, or even if you've just watched one part. It means a lot to me, and I'm really thankful for everybody who's come along with this entire journey, because this was a lot of fun to write. However, that's the end of this video. I hope you all have a good day. I'm going to see you all later. Bye.